please welcome to the DLD All-Stars, Bjarke Ingels, my good friend Bjarke Ingels, a real Thank you. DLD All-Star. He is one of the busiest architects in the world. With his company, BIG, he follows socially, economically, and ecologically um, sustainable approach to architecture and urbanism. Bjarke, I can see you. Hello. <laughs> Good for the environment and increasing the quality of life for the people. Bjarke first spoke at DLD in 2008. So, was, so were the times, remember? No, it was uh, <laughs> physical presence, so yeah. exotic. Yeah, so exotic. <laughs> then you spoke on the future of cities and has been back since when you have been back since then many times once we met in new york remember we are no, sure. joined by a dld newbie who is just as busy and just as well known i'm very proud john that you're here john schellenhuber <laughs> renowned climate researcher and director emeritus of the potsdam institute for climate impact he served climate impact research sorry He served a scientific. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Good. He served a scientific advisor to several eminent leaders, who next to President von der Leyen include German Chancellor Angela Merkel, former European Commission President José Manuel Barroso, and even Pope Francis. So, my dear friends, um, the floor is yours. What are you talking about? Please start. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we um, I think we had agreed that um, bo both John and I would would make a little introduction to uh, mm. our different takes on the subject and 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 continue it with a 15 minute uh, conversation. So, so John, with your permission, uh, I'll get please, straight to it. Please go ahead, Pjarke. Okay. So, so maybe if you can please uh, share my screen. Um, this uh, this is my office, uh, uh, or at least what what it used to look like. Uh, because of course the last the last year uh, we've been working like this and and when the pandemic and the lockdown came we realized that we actually had the power to address one of the biggest challenges the world was facing at the time which was we could turn our model shop and our 3d printers into manufacturing uh, emergency medical equipment like face shields uh, uh, and venti ventilator connections for uh, a health sector that was overrun by the pandemic so we thought like, are there other great challenges we could actually turn our skills towards? And uh, of course, climate change, we have been sort of strangely incapable. This is from Copenhagen, the failed summit in 2009. Uh, so despite the kind of popular demand for action, we have been quite bad at taking specific action against climate change. So we thought maybe if we can address bigger problems by going smaller in scale to the product scale, maybe we can also go bigger in scale to to the scale of the entire planet. Um, and I think one of my favorite examples of the human capability to address large scale challenges over generations is our ability to uh, have built cathedrals. This is the Cologne Cathedral and it took 632 years to build it, but we built it anyway because we had a master plan. So we thought, what if we could actually make a master plan for the entire planet, and we called it Master Planet. Uh, what if we consider all of Earth holistically as a 510 million square kilometer mixed use uh, habitat for both humans, but also all the other forms of life? And what if we could actually master plan it to have a carbon footprint of zero? Because climate change is nothing new. Four and a half billion years ago, we were a ball of lava, and two and a half billion years ago, we were a ball of snow. Uh, what's new is that it's happening so fast. If you look back 500 million years, you can see that there's always been a correlation between CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere in gray and temperature in blue. You can see the ice ages as dips in carbon and dips in temperature. And then you can see, this is the last 500 years, you can see the last 100 years, there's been this kind of little increase in the CO2 content of the atmosphere, we've reached 415 parts per million, and it doesn't look so dramatic, but you have to go back more than 20 million years to find the same concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. And 
And the last like 220 million years ago, there were no, none of these animals existed, including uh, ourselves, human beings. And maybe just a little warning, like uh, in, a, in a normal meeting room or a, a, um, an indoor room, the, the ventilation automatically kicks in when CO2 levels reaches a thousand parts per million, because that's when air is seen or CO2 is see, deemed unbreathable uh, by, by humans. And, and, and why is this happening? It's because the last 200 years, we, we've experienced this incredible growth, also uh, increase in life quality and life expectancy. And it's been fueled by coal and crude oil and, and natural gas and, and some renewables. Today, the biggest contributor is China. But when you look back 200 years, EU has actually been the single largest contributor uh, to, to climate change. So we really owe to do something about it. And there's a series of... Uh, human activities that contribute to greenhouse gases. And the biggest culprit in blue is, is carbon dioxide, but also methane from a lot of agriculture, from rice fields and, and cows. Um, so we divided this master plan into five contributors to carbon emissions and five other sustainable habitat concerns. And each of them, of course, tying into each other. So the five main contributors to climate change are energy, food, industry, transport, and waste and resources. And in addition, we need to take care of biodiversity, pollution of other things like plastics in the oceans, access to water, human health, and, and urban habitat. And I think this graph somehow sums up the challenge. On the left, you see the different industries uh, or sectors and how they contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. And since we're talking about the European Bauhaus, this is the sector that deals with the built environment. You have concrete, various chemicals, and the steel industry becoming or being major contributors. And if you look at the built environment, every month we contribute, we built another New York City on all of Earth. Um, and when you look at the built environment, you have the embodied energy that, that is embodied in the building, but then you also have the operational energy that it contributes every year. So all the materials that you need to extract, the manufacturing of the building materials, the transportation to the building site, the actual building process itself, and then finally the building operates and contributes yearly to uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then there's what happens after you decommission a building. And you can see here, like certain materials have a lot of embodied energy like aluminum or steel, but, but other uh, materials like wood is actually carbon negative. And, and this is something John knows a lot about, uh, but maybe just to put it into perspective, for every ton of building materials you can replace with mass timber, you actually capture 2.1 tons of carbon or 7.7 .7 tons of CO2. Um, so it's an incredibly interesting aspect to, to look into in, in the building environment. So essentially our, our suggestion for the master plan is really to consider it a master plan like any other, just at a very large scale, including an area table, uh, a cost calculation and a, and a phasing strategy, because we really need to consider our entire home as a single holistic ecosystem where we play such a big role that today the absence of planning is actually having devastating impact at a planetary scale. So on that note, over to you, John. Okay. Yeah, first of all, I really love it. Uh, and you gave a beautiful climate lecture already, Bjarke. So let me follow up a little bit and try to turn it into something very concrete related to the new European Bauhaus. So maybe you can put up the slides now. Wonderful. And I will ask you to click on uh, because I cannot operate it from here. No, no, just go back. Just go back. So the new European Bauhaus. And so I'm a climate scientist. I've worked for 30 years in what you may call, and I think we all should call the biggest challenge of the 21st century, namely stabilizing the world's climate. So uh, there was a very important event. Piake was already referring to uh, Copenhagen in 2009. I was there. It was extremely frustrating. But what was less frustrating was, next slide, please. And click, please. Okay. So here, 
Here we go, hold it. The Paris Agreement in 2015, you see the final sort of jubilant <laughs> sort of scene here, and it became international law that we have to keep global warming below two degrees and try everything to even keep it to 1.5 degrees only. But what is the reality? Next slide, please. So here you see that uh, last year in 2020, global mean temperature was already 1.25 degrees above pre-industrial. So we're very close to the Paris corridor already. And what you see on the right hand side is that a record number of 29 tropical storms were observed in the Atlantic. So why is that so? Next slide. What we see here is a, a very impressive observation. Uh, where does the extra heat go? Because of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, Bjarke mentioned, the Earth is importing more energy from the Sun when it is radiating back uh, to outer space. Actually, the, the import, the excess import is equivalent to four uh, Hiroshima bombs exploding every second. So that's the energy equivalent we are importing every second for Hiroshima bombs. So where does the heat go to? What you see here is the distribution of heat, of excess heat. And in blue, you have the various layers of the ocean. It goes down the heat even below 2000 meters. Only 2% of that extra heat are used to warm the atmosphere and 4% are used to melt down the ice actually. Yeah? So, and that is the problem. Once this heat wells up from the oceans, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah? So we have to stop this. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Where is actually the silver bullet to resolve the crisis. There is one and it's called Mother Nature actually. We need to reduce actually, actually to cut in half emissions every decade. That's what we call the carbon law. But if you click now, please click. Yeah, here, the biosphere is actually the only ally we have. So because the biosphere, in particular the forests of the world, are absorbing 30% of the emissions we are sort of putting into the atmosphere. What we're doing right now is killing our best friends by burning the Amazon forest and other things. So we first have to rescue our friends and then we have to reforest degraded land and then, and that's the most important thing of all, we need to use, as Piake has already said, timber from the forest and turn it into buildings, of course, replant the trees and so on. So next slide, please. And this is the great vision. And it's not only a vision, it's actually something we published uh, last year in a, in, a, in a top journal, Nature Sustainability. We showed that if you actually take from forestry the timber, and turn it into buildings, into urban forests, so to speak, then you can create a huge global carbon sink and you can suck up up to 30% of the global emission. Huh? So that's the future. And this is, next slide, this is what the European Bauhaus is also all about. It is about transforming the built environment and style. So my last remark on that is, since about 40% of emissions come from constructing and operating buildings, the built environment is really the elephant in the climate room. And this elephant is now emitting CO2, tremendous amounts, but we can turn it into a friendly elephant, which is sucking up CO2 from the atmosphere. And that is our goal, turn the angry elephant into a friendly elephant. So. Let's try to discuss this now, Pjarke. I'm done with my presentation and let's have a good conversation now. For sure. No, but I, but I think it's, um, uh, what, I, what, I what I love about the initiative and, uh, and, and I know you had a, a role to play in, in, in coming up with this idea of, of, a, of a new Bauhaus is uh, 
it's, ba it's basically the, the, the idea of, um, you know, you can say like uh, brilliant ideas are, uh, are for free and a lot, of, a lot of people can have a lot of brilliant ideas, but what really, what really matters is the execution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think we are in a, in a strange situation right now where there is an abundance uh, of, of great and accurate ideas. And there's actually a lot of available technologies, but there's not a lot of execution or there's not a lot of scaling. And, and I think um, the new European Bauhaus could be a major contributor to actually identifying and connecting and scaling up the initiatives that, that mm. can make a difference now. Yeah. Now, let me also say something about this term with the Bauhaus and so on. You know, if we we know that we have to stabilize the climate, otherwise our civilization will go down the drain. I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm absolutely sure about that. Also, we have to keep global warming below two degrees. We might actually overshoot that temperature in the course of a century, but we can then pump ourselves back by using timber. Actually, we can even sort of purify the atmosphere uh, in the course of 100 years with what I call the forestry construction pump. Uh, so we can reverse in a way all the wrongdoings we are actually executing that right now. But the second part of the vision is the following. Why using the Bauhaus? Uh, because in 1919 in Weimar in Germany, a group around every architect knows that, of course, Walter Gropius uh, set out to change the world of architecture of the built environment. And why did they want to do it? Because they had the vision to provide decent living room and decent buildings to not only the elites, but actually to the lower classes of society and the middle class and so on. That was a social vision at the time. Now, if Walter Kropius would be reborn right now uh, and would look around in the world we are in, uh, then I'm sure he would actually become an ecologist and would say the built environment has to solve the climate crisis instead of exacerbating it. Uh. So let's just put ourselves in the shoes of Gropio, Sedal, uh, Kandinsky and all these great artists actually and say, let's restart with Swish 100 years later. And I think the new European Bauhaus is precisely the right platform for that. I, I also think that, the, um, uh, as, as you know, the. Um, the, the Bauhaus movement was referring to architecture uh, as the Gesamtkunstwerk. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, the the total work of art. It was the the medium in which all the other art forms came mm. to uh, uh, fruition. And I and I do believe that it is very relevant in the context of climate change because uh, you can say all the different uh, sectors mm. uh, are like silos. And if you start thinking holistically, um, in each silo, there might, might be certain byproducts that, uh, that are not identified as having value. So therefore, we just let them go uh, into the atmosphere in the form of, uh, uh, of, of CO2 coming out of the chimney or the exhaust mm. pipe. But, uh, but if you would start combining things, uh, you could actually start using some of the CO2 or the carbon uh, f for other things. So in, in, in essence, pollution, whether it's pollution of the atmosphere or pollution of the oceans or the rivers or the, the environment in general, is because we have byproducts that have not been identified as valuable and therefore have not been tied back into the processes. So I think this idea of Gesamtkunstwerk mm. also counts for the coming together of all the sciences of all the different disciplines into a new integrated holistic approach to to the built environment no I, I i also love your mentioning of the cathedral you know the cologne or Reims or chartres wherever because this was not only a gesamtkunstwerk in a way but it also where everything paintings uh, and architecture and and design and everything work together but it was also architecture is the most public of all arts if you like uh, because it is built like in Reims by an entire community together uh. so if we want to make the green deal the european green deal really popular 
We have to involve the public, every every part of society in that. Uh, and this can be done if we build the cathedrals of the 21st century, beautiful buildings from timber, for example, in public places, everybody will buy in. Uh, it's uh, the opportunity of a lifetime, I think. Thank you so much, Bjarke and John. This was very inspiring and I hope audience you could attach to it and you got energized so it, you got informed about it. At this place I have to thank you very much to Augusto from Bayern, the wonderful <laughs> inspiration and origin uh, thought leader for the Biotopia project. Please mm -hmm. audience find out what Biotopia is. It's a wonderful vision that all comes together. Biotopia. We will have a DLD thing soon and we explain it. So I'm so sorry to cut you off. I hope our, <laughs> your conversation will continue. And, I'm sure. Um, I, I would be happy being part of it. We have all together create an, an environment where we engage and be active in, trans, in the transformation of this. Thank you so much. <laughs>